Okay, well, hello and welcome back to the Vantage Seminar. And today we're very happy to have Alessandra Sarti speaking about old and new on the symmetry groups of the K3 surfaces. And Alessandra, is this okay for us to um, video your talk? That's fine, yeah. perfect, yeah. no problem with that. All right, thanks so much for speaking today. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. I'm really happy to, to give this talk, this opportunity. And um, so as um, the title of my talk says, so I will talk about only new on symmetry groups of K3 surfaces. So um, you will see all the new results about the uh, automorphism of K3 surfaces. And uh, I will say something about uh, maybe some picture like that one. So just to, uh, I want to ju just uh, very short to remember uh, some, something already Edgar introduced two weeks ago. So the definition of uh, a K3 surface, which is a, a compact complex smooth manifold of dimension two, which is simply connected. And uh, up to scalar modification, we have only one holomorphic uh, global two form without zero. So this means uh, that, um, that uh, the, the, the vector space of uh, global section of omega two S is one dimensional generated by these two form that uh, I will call uh, often period of the K3 surface. And uh, more precisely, so in my talk, I want to study what, what is called the automorphism group of S. So these are all the holomorphic map from S to S. And um, this uh, group has a lot of uh, nice properties. So we will see some of them. And well, when you have an automorphism, in some sense, you have a symmetry of the, the K3 surface. And so we will, we will study that. So if you want to see a K3 surface, well, maybe the most easy way to, to see that. So again, I, I make a link to Edgar's talk uh, last week. He was talking about a very beautiful projective model of K3 surfaces. And maybe the most easy are smooth quartics in P3. So you take a homogeneous polynomial of degree four, you take the zero set and uh, you get a K3 surface. If you want to see a K3 surface, well, you see this golden uh, surface is a K3 surface. And you see the equation is uh, quite special because it contains somehow is a deformation from one of the Fermat surface. Actually, we will see very several times during the talk the, the Fermat surface. So let me just recall what uh, I can say about the name, which is a quite a very nice story about K3 surface. If you don't, don't know about that, you should uh, absolutely know. So the name K3 was given by André Veil in 1958 in a report on a research project uh, for his research stay in Paris, who say that uh, dans, dans la seconde partie de mon rapport, il s'agit de variété kellerienne dite K3, ainsi nommée en l'honneur de Kumer Keller Kodaire de la belle montagne K2 Kashmir. So the name comes from the mountain K2, and then from the three great mathematicians, Kumar, Kehler, and Kodaira, who did very much uh, the study, well, a lot of contribution in the study of surfaces, and in particular of K3 surfaces. So you say here the K2 mountain was climbed just a few years before uh, Andre Veil gave, uh, gave the name. And for curiosity, as to maybe if, uh, you know K3 and you actually say, if, does, it, does it exist a K3 mountain? Well, it does. So there is a K3 mountain in Kashmir, which is called the Broad Peak. And this is the 11th highest mountain in the world. So only say 8,000 meters. And the first climb were around the time where Andre Veil gave the name to, to K3 surfaces in 1957. So you see here the, the K3 mountain. But well, let's, so this uh, was just a warming up. Let's go now back to automorphism. So I want to show you maybe the, the, a very easy one. Again, one take a quartic K3 uh, surface and let's take the, quart the Fermat quartic in complex dimensional space. So the quartic Fermat admits a lot of, a lot of automorphism. So the automorphism group is uh, infinite. But in particular, you, say, you see, I wrote here down, so an evolution. So this, uh, this map, that just saying the size, sign of one coordinate, so the first one. And if you write down the two forms, so it is a hypersurface in P3, and one can easily write down the, the, the two form. By this involution, this is multiplied by minus one. So, so the 
automorphism change the sign of the two form. So this automorphism are what are, will be called the non-symplectic automorphism or non-symplectic involution because it does not preserve the, the, the symplectic form. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Maybe when one talk about K3 surface, one has to talk absolutely about lattice theory. So, because, you know, when you study K3 surfaces, so lattice theory is really an important tool to understand the geometry and the properties of K3 surfaces. So first of all, record that for a K3 surface, if you take the second cohomology with integer coefficient, so the H2 SZ, it is always the same. So it does not depend on the K3 surface. You can change your K3, but this never change. It is three copy of U, so the hyperbolic plane, and two copy of E8. So, and I will call this lattice the K3 lattice. So as I say, it does not depend on the K3. And U, I wrote uh, here down, so it is a rank two lattice, uh, which is of signature one, one, and the unimodular. And E8 is the lattice associated to the same root system with the same name. So the K3 lattice is a lattice of rank 22. You see, you have three copies of U and two copies of E8, and signature 319. So I take E8 uh, negative definite here. And even just to, to remind you, it just means that any time you make a, a cap product of two elements of H2, so the, the a lattice is a freezy module with a bilinear form, which is non-degenerate. And for a K3 surface, you, you take, of course, the cap product. So this means that a square of an element is in 2Z. So this means even. And when you have an automorphism of S, then it induces an action in cohomology. And then when you are in cohomology, you can compute what is called the invariant lattice. So this means you take all co-cycle in H2SZ that are invariant by the action of G. And uh, we will see later that uh, this lattice is, this invariant lattice is quite important because it can give uh, some information, for example, about the Picard number of a K3 surface to have um, an automorphism. So let me uh, formulate the problem of at least some problem uh, related to, to automorphism of K3 surfaces. Of course, study automorphism of uh, varieties in general is always very useful because uh, you can understand a lot of property with this. I mean, you have information about geometry, modular spaces, and so on. So here I will uh, uh, concentrate on automorphism of finite order on K3 surfaces. And some main problem when you when you study automorphism is to classify finite groups G that can act on K3 and study, for example, the action on cohomology. This, for example, in view of, uh, of study um, moduli spaces. So rem remember, or uh, if you don't know, I mean that most of the K3 surfaces have infinite automorphism group. So this is, there are only a few that have finite automorphism group and these are all class classified. So this means all the Picard lattices are known. These are by result of uh, Nikulin and Wimberg. To give you an example, if you take a K3 surface of Picard number 20, for example, uh, always, you have always uh, infinite order automorphism group. So why that? So you take a K3 surface of Picard number 20, and then there is a result of Shodan in order, classical one, 1977, where um, they show that one can construct a um, elliptic vibration with an infinite order section. And anytime you have an elliptic vibration with an infinite order section, then this gives you an automorphism of the K3 by translation. And then your, your K3 surface has an infinite automorphism group. Yeah. So don't hesitate if you have questions so I can uh, just interrupt me if something is not. But otherwise, when you study a finite automorphism group on a K3 surface, then uh, you take an automorphism, it, it induces an action on the, on the H0 omega 2s, on the period, let's say. 
And that will denote, so in that case, you have your, you take an element in G, you apply to the two form, and this is multiplied by some constant that they call alpha G, C star. So the space is one dimensional, and you have this constant. So one get a map, a morphism of group from G to C star, that to G associate alpha G, this constant. And then uh, if G has finite order, then alpha G is an n root of unity. It does not need to be primitive, but it is a root of unity. And uh, if uh, G is finite, then, um, then the image of alpha is a, is a psychic group, because a subgroup, a final subgroup of C star. So this means that it is some M root of unity, mu M, so for some. So that one gets an exact sequence, that one, where you have your group G in the middle, your finite group. And then you, you have this map alpha from G to mu M, so associating this. Um, this color alpha G, uh, thanks to this action. And then, of course, so one can look at the kernel of this map. So this means the element that acts as identity on the two form. And I will call this group G0. So these are the element that does not change the two form or with other word that acts as identity on the H0. And this exact sequence says um, several things. Well, um, you see here the graph you can again, G0, as I say, are those that access the identity. And so that are called the symplectic automorphisms. Well, it preserves the symplectic form. If there are no symplectic automorphism in G, then this means the G is cyclic. So this allows us to go to the notion of non-symplectic. So an automorphism is called non-symplectic when it, in fact, does not preserve the two form. So there is some action on the two form. And um, if it has order n and acts by multiplic multiplication by a primitive n root of unity, then one says that sigma acts purely non-symplectically. So when you have an automorphism acting non-symplectically, it can act by a primitive root of unity or not. Okay, for example, it is of order four, but it acts also by minus one. This, for example, is non-symplectic. Purely non-symplectically, so this means that you have really a, a genuine uh, end root of unity as the order of sigma. In particular, so this tells us that, that the exact sequence tells that if the group G, any element, each element in G acts purely non-symplectically, then G is a cyclic group. So in that case, these groups are, I would not say easy to study, but maybe uh, more easy than, than the general case with G is any group. So one important theorem, of course, when you study uh, automorphism is the Torelli theorem. So it's a beautiful theorem. So I, I decided to, to recall it uh, because it shows the power of, uh, of lattice theory. So Nikulin started in the eighties, the study of automorphism. He was the first one giving first result on automorphism of K3 surfaces. And um, he used a lot of, he developed a lot, auto, a lot of machinery coming from lattice theory. And this machinery from lattice theory allows to give many results by using isometries of lattices. And thanks to Torelli theorem, this can uh, pull back to K3 surfaces. So the Torelli theorem, so from Piatecki, uh, Shapiro and Shafarevich, uh, say that if you have two K3 surfaces, S and S prime, and an isometry of the two lattices, H2S Z and H2S prime Z, which is more always a Hodge isometry, so, to, so it's in the period of one to the period of the other, so the line span to the period of one to the line span to the period of the other, and send a Keller class to a Keller class, so it is an effective Hodge isometry, then there is a unique isomorphism from S prime to S, such that S star is equal phi. Of course, the case interesting for us is when S prime is equal to S. So you see why lattice theory, having a lot of result of lattice theory is really important to, uh, to understand automorphism of K3 surfaces. So how to attack the problem of study automorphism? Well, one maybe first step is uh, split the problem in uh, study the symplectic automorphism and purely non-symplectic automorphism or non-symplectic automorphism. Then one has understand, so 
somehow this allows you to understand uh, the part G0 and the part mu M of the sequence. And then one can use this result, G0 mu M, G0 is a symplectic part, let's say, and mu M the non-symplectic part, to get then information on G. And the first question that one can ask, maybe the most natural one, is uh, how big can be G, G0 and M? How, how big can be their order? So I will say some word uh, about G0 and G most of the time. And say maybe uh, something about uh, first uh, finite group of automorphism um, uh, that are abelian. So let's say abelian group uh, acting on K3 surfaces. So in a famous paper, finite groups of automorphism of Kellerian surface of type K3 in 1976, Nikulin classified all finite abelian groups that act symplectically on a K3 surface. And in fact, there are 40 cases different from the identity. So this is a list. So the, the paper of Nikulin is uh, the, maybe the first paper that really uh, give a lot of result on, uh, on automorphism where he compute, for example, give a lot of information about fixed locus, about invariant lattice in the cohomology and so on. And uh, in this classification of uh, finite groups uh, that uh, are abelian and can act on a K3 surface, there are these 14 cases different from the identity. So there is Z modulo NZ with two between, uh, uh, with N between two and eight. So you see, if you want just prime order, you have, you have order two, three, five, and seven, just that. So you cannot have simply automorphism of order bigger than seven. Then ZM times uh, Z modulo NZ for M equal to three and four. Z times two Z time, times Z times uh, modulo four Z. Z modulo 2Z times Z modulo 6Z and Z uh, modulo 2Z uh, three times or four times. These are the, the, maybe a first step in the classification of this group. And uh, as I say, an important problem is to determine the action in cohomology. And I want just to give you here in the first part before to go to the, uh, to the general uh, discussion about the group G, the unicity of the action in cohomology. So what can one say about uh, that? What, uh, how, maybe, how can one compute that uh, in, in some case? Well, first of all, if a G0 is one of the preso group, so you take away this uh, one of this abelian group. So the, there is a result of Nikuli, a foundational one, that say that uh, if G0 is one of the preso, previous abelian group, then up to conjugacy by an element in OL, OL are just the isometry of L, of the K3 lattice, then the action is unique. So it is a quite strong result, you should think, because uh, this tells you that if you want to understand the action in cohomology, so what do you have to do? So you just to take your favorite example, you compute in that case, and then it's any, it is always the same for each other K3 surface. So the result is not true if you drop the assumption that G0 is abelian. So in this case, we are abelian symplectic. So abelian symplectic, the action is unique. But if you consider only symplectic, then it's no more true. So you can have different actions. And so Morrison in 1984, so at the end of this, uh, this uh, result, could compute the action, for example, for symplectic involution. And the action exchanged two copies of E8. So remember the K3 lattice has three copy of U, the parabolic plane, a two copy of E8. And he constructs uh, showing an example that uh, the action exchanges the two copy of the E8 and preserves the rest. So that uh, we know now for each symplectic involution, this is the action actually. And in several papers together with Gabagnati between 2007 and 2009, we computed the invariant sublattice of the K3 lattice for the remaining abelian groups. So of course, the result of Morrison give you the, an answer of what is the invariant lattice, because you know the action, you can compute that. Together with Gagambagnati, we computed this invariant lattice. We, we were not able to compute exactly the action on the cycles, on the co-cycle, on the H2, but uh, with some lattice theory and some good example on hand, we could compute uh, the invariant lattice. And when you have the invariant lattice, as I say, the important fact is that you can start moduli spaces. Okay. So 
do you have any other questions so far? So, okay, so I go on and I show you how, um, how one can attack the problem of computing the lattice. So very useful K3 surfaces, beautiful one, are elliptic vibration. So take a, an elliptic vibration on a K3 surface. So the, the equation is this one. So y square equal to E3 plus ATX plus BT. AT and BT are polynomials with complex coefficients. The degree of AT is less or equal than eight and the degree of BT is less or equal than 12 for a K3 surface. And if you choose well your AT and BT, your polynomial, then your, your elliptic vibration can admit torsion section, for example, for the two or for the three. As I say before, anytime you have a section on, a, on an elliptic vibration, this section by translation on each fiber give you an automorphism of the K3. So if you have a torsion section, give you an automorphism of order, the order of the torsion section. And this was our idea, actually, how to compute these uh, invariant lattices. So for example, I wanted to give a, a concrete example. So take um, the polynomial so that the, 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 the vibration has a three torsion section. I don't write down the polynomial are quite too big, but is not so, so important here, but you can, can construct such a section. And um, generically, the, the vibration has a six fiber E1. So these are cubic, uh, smooth cubic, so are cubic with the nodes, uh, uh, and six fiber of type E3. So these are the fibers in the codire classification, and there are three angles like this. And if you compute the key, of the fiber give you 24 as it should be for uh, a K3 surface. And how is the action? Well, the, the you see, so it is, you have Weierstrass model. So you have a zero section here that meet all the fibers. And you have, uh, one can show that the three section acts non-trivially. So on, uh, on the vibration, of course, A, and uh, um, it, it is like a cyclic permutation of the component on the, C, on the six E3 fibers and fixes one point in each of the E1 fiber. So this matches act actually with the classification of Mikulin, who say that uh, take a symplectic automorphism of order three, then it has six fixed points, six isolated fixed points. Okay, and then thanks to this uh, vibration, well, one can describe the narrow severity group, and with some work also the transcendental lattice of the, of the elliptic vibration. So there is quite a lot about the elliptic vibration and one can compute the invariant lattice. The invariant lattice is, um, it is essentially uh, contains the transcendental lattice plus the invariant part of the neuron severity group. It is an over lattice and we, we could compute that. So thanks to the example on the elliptic vibration. So take a K3 surface, which is projective or not, it does not matter. So the, the, what I was saying before about the classification of Nikulin, uh, you don't need to have a projective K3. So the, these K3 surfaces, which are not projective and have um, autom symplectic automorphism. And this unicity of the action does not depend on the fact of the K3 is projective or not. So take a K3, projective or not, does not matter and assume that it has a symplectic automorphism of order three, then one can compute the invariant lattice, which is u plus u3 squared plus a2 squared. So u3 is just uh, the hyperbolic plane and you have the form multiplied by three, but just that. And a2 is just the, the root lattice a2 negative definite. And then one can compute the orthogonal complement. So H2 is a unimodular lattice. So when you have a unimodular lattice, so the orthogonal complement is, um, one can, can good understand the orthogonal, complement, uh, the orthogonal complement of the, the invariant lattice. So, and uh, it turns out that uh, we could identify it and it is a, what is called the coxeter todd lattice, which is a rank uh, 12 even lattice of discriminant d to the power six. Again, this minus two in the, in the parentheses means just that the bilinear form is multiplied by minus two. So K12 is positive definite, here is a, I want a negative definite. 
And it was interesting because it's a lattice, a remarkable lattice, because give the densest sphere packing in dimension 12 known so far. And in fact, when we classify all these invariant lattices for this abelian group, we could find other uh, dense lattices, which uh, was quite interesting. And well, this is a still active research area because as I say, we could compute these lattices, but not really identify the action on the co-cycles. And last week uh, on February 1st, I think I saw a paper on archive, uh, a result of Garbagnati and Prieto that could compute explicitly the action on H2 SZ. So like in the, the sense of Morrison, so they show that there are some copy of A6 that are exchanged, so they could compute it on the co-cycles. So there is still uh, work to do. So let's say now some, something about group of symplectic automorphism. So the first step was, okay, we can say something when the group is abelian, symplectic and abelian. Now let's drop the assumption of abelian. So we take a symplectic group, so group acting symplectically on K3, finite, but any, we drop the assumption of abelian. And then there was an important result of Mukal in 1988 that uh, gives somehow um, describe some this group in some sense, because it says that any final group acting symplectically on a K3 surface is a subgroup of the Mathieu group M23, which is a spectacular result. We say everything is uh, in that groups. And well, record that M23 is one of the 26 sporadicus group. There are five Mathieu groups, uh, M11, 12, 22, 23, and 24. So M23 is one of that. And Mukai, describes in this, uh, so show this, uh, well, this result, and in, in his paper, show that there are 11 maximal finite groups, 11 maximalities uh, with respect to the inclusion okay, that can act symplectically on a K3 surface. And moreover, he give example for uh, all, for, for each of the groups, he find a K3 surface with uh, such an action. So the, it turns out that in these cases, the K3 surface has Picard number 20. So we'll see that, uh, I will show uh, in detail that in a minute, so some, uh, some, um, some computation. And um, some years later, Xiao could find again the result of Mukai in, with another, in another way. So the result of Mukai was studying very much action on cohomology. And uh, Xiao gave a proof by studying the quotient. So when you have a K3 surface with a symplectic action of an automorphism, you take the quotient, the minimal resolution, and then the minimal resolution is again K3. And so, I mean, this can give you a lot of information on, uh, on the automorphism group and on the K3 surfaces uh, with which you started. Because the quotient has only ADA singularities, the, the Picard number is bounded by 20, so you cannot have any singularities. And so, so it's, Xiao, Xiao follows a bit the same idea as Nikulin, so studying singularities in the quotient. And so you give a complete list and you have 81 groups. Uh, you, so you find again your cyclic groups that can act symplectically on, um, on a K3 surface. So some more about the biggest of this group, because it is uh, actually the the main character of what, what is going in the next uh, slide, which is the Mathieu groups M20. So we call Mathieu group, even if it's not normal. So that's why I, I did not put in the, the previous uh, list. Uh, it is M20, which can be described as the, the semi-direct pro product of A5 with Z modulo to, uh, 2Z to the power four, or it can be described as the stabilizer uh, of 21 and 22 in the Mathieu group M22. So it is the biggest one of the, the Mukai's group, Mukai's uh, um, uh, groups, and it has order 960. So the other groups has a smaller group. I think the, this, the next one has a group around 300, 380, so it's much smaller. And let me recall here the example of Mukai about uh, the K3 surface with this action. So again, you see, so you, See appearing somehow the Fermat appear always all the time. And it is that equation. So x0 to the power four, x1 to the power four, x2 to the power four, x3 to the power four plus 12, x0, x1, x2, x3 equal to zero. So let me call this surface x mu because uh, we will see that 
uh, a bit later when we will talk about the uh, final group acting any generality on a few free surfaces. And actually, it seems so. I say uh, Muka gave an example for each of the for, for each of this maximal group, but it seems that uh, there are infinitely many K3 surfaces with an M20 action. So these are just pointing the moduli space of K3 because I have a picard number 20. There are countably many, but it seems that there are infinitely many. So this is a work in progress by Paula Comparin and uh, Romain Demel, who is a PhD student of mine. That who are working on that uh, on that question. So now uh, let's go a step uh, further again, and uh, let us assume that uh, the groups, uh, the assumptions that the group acts symplectically. Okay, so we started with a billion group acting symplectically. Then uh, we drop the, the the we remove the assumption of a billion, and uh, now. Let's see what happened now. So we are in all generality. So take a G. So this means that G now uh, we are assuming that G has also some non symplectic part. So this part mu M is M is bigger than bigger than zero, even bigger than one. So sorry, bigger than zero means bigger than one. And um, otherwise, so it is, uh, I mean, I really want uh, some genuine root of unity, not one. So if mu m is not identity, so there is a result of, uh, of Nikulin that say that, um, that all K3 surfaces are projective. So as soon as you have a non symplectic automorphism, one can construct an m class that gives you some embedding in some projective space. So this is much different from the symplectic case where you can have the K3 surfaces are killer, but not necessarily projective. And while you can have killer K3 that are not projective and have symplectic automorphism, okay? So here you have just, um, but if M is positive, uh, if mu M is not identity, these are all projective one. And there was an important result then of Kondo in 1999, who could determine the, the order of G. So remember one of our question was uh, how big can be G? Okay, G zero we have, we know now it, it is uh, 960 because um, it is this, uh, this uh, MUCA classification. And then uh, Kondo uh, could, uh, could describe the biggest order of a group G any group. And he showed that in fact, the order of G is less or equal than 3,840. So it is four times 960. And if it, you have equality, so this is, is possible and uh, then your K3 surface is a Kummer surface. And Kondo could describe that, which is the Kummer surface of the product of EI times EI, where EI is uh, the elliptic curve with a um, complex multiplication by I. Okay. And uh, the group G is an isomorphic to an extension of M20 by Z modulo 4Z. So it is not uh, strange that the G0 part if you want, of symplectic automorphism here is M20, which is the biggest group that can act uh, symplectically. Okay, and it shows moreover that in this case, the action of uh, G uh, uh, and uh, G and S are unique. So there are no more than that. So there is only one K3, which is this Kummer surface with the action of this group. So, so any question so far? It's going great, thank you. <laughs> so, so how, how now uh, we want to classify uh, these groups? Okay, oh, sorry. Uh, well, first, uh, so the, the idea is now uh, you have this, uh, this, uh, this group G that, uh, that uh, of Kondo, so you know it is the biggest one, but uh, one can also ask, can you have other groups that, uh, that are maximal? So again, with respect to the inclusion, in the sense as MUKAID, the classification that MUKAID. Well, this is actually what we want to do now, what we want to talk about now. So we have seen that Kondo is uh, this extension, give this extension for G of M20 by MU4. 
So the, the, sweet, the exact sequence of contours is M20, G, Mu4. Are more extension of M20? So that's uh, the question we, we started to, to study this last year. Can we extend M20 with, uh, with other autosimilities? And well, the answer is yes. So there are two more extension of uh, M20. Uh, now by Mu2. Mu4 is not possible. So we have seen, so it's the result of Condor. But uh, well, one can have less. And in fact, this is possible. And we find two such groups and also unique K3 with this action. So this was a result. We had uh, uh, this last year, so last year, actually in 2020, we had found with uh, Cedric Bonafé. And uh, there was, uh, this was shown independently by um, Simon Brandhorst and Kenji Hashimoto. So they actually we discovered at some point, as it happened sometime, that we work on the same topic. And well, of course, we start to exchange uh, with each other and discuss with each other. But just to, before to say some word about maybe the proof, just to give mm -hmm. an idea of technique, the paper of Brando Hashimoto contains a bit more because in fact, all, they classify all pair of a K3 surface and G, where G is a, a subgroup of the automorphism of S. So G is a, this a finite group of automorphism. And the symplectic part of G is G0, uh, where G0 is one of these 11 maximal subgroup of Mukai, not only M20. So, you know, for, so one can decide to look at M20 and see what happened, but one can take one of the other 11 maximal subgroup. So it turns out that you cannot have a bigger order. So the extension of M20 gives you always the biggest order, but you can find, of course, other maximal, uh, maximal groups in G. And just to give an idea of what they found, so they found 42 pairs of GNS. And, um, and moreover, they found, uh, they showed the existence with Torelli again. So they showed that all pairs are possible, but uh, could not find example in any case. So you, sometime you get the K3 that have very high polarization. And so it's not so easy to find um, immediately example. And um, so at that time, so they found 25 cases, but I think uh, now they have some more because uh, so they put the paper on archive, they say people tell us if you have more example. And I think in the meaning time, they found some more example, but there is still some room to work to, to find the example. And in 2009, a bit before, I wanted to, to, to mention also this result, Christina Franzen classified the groups G0 times mu2 uh, the extension, the, the central extension of uh, G0, where G0 is one of these 11 maximal subgroups. Then, I mean, this was a, an intermediate steps between Condor result and then the result of the last time. So there was some time where not much happened and then people started again to, to study the problem. So let's uh, say some more now about this uh, degree two extension. So as I said, so Condor, consider the degree four extension of M20, which is the biggest one. And then uh, actually I will give you a motivation why here you can have only four and two. And you cannot have a more three, more five or more seven. But let's formulate our result. So together with Bonafé in 2020, Brandos Hashimoto, the same. There are two non-isomorphic group G, that can, you can plug in this exact sequence actually, where the G invariant part of the Picard group and the, of the K3 surface and the transcendental lattices are those I gave, I gave here. So you mean you have a polarization of degree four that is invariant by the group, and this is the Picard lattice, so the transcendental lattice. And uh, you have also a polarization of degree. So in the other case, we have a polarization of degree eight and the other transcendental lattice. So here we had some lack because the, the polarization are not too high. And you will see, I can give you equation of this K3 because you, here you have a quartic and then you have a complete intersection of three quadrants. And these K3 surfaces are in fact uh, Kummer surfaces. And for this, I will give you some reason for that. So let me say uh, some uh, step uh, in the proof just to give you an idea. So it, it, uh, how, 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 which, which ingredient one can use. Well, the, First recall that the transcendental lattice is the orthogonal complement of the Picard group, the Picard lattice in the H2. And uh, again, you've seen at the beginning, uh, let me recall here the invariant lattice. The sub lattice, the K3 lattice 
of invariant cycles. Okay, so that, uh, and uh, one can show, take a symplectic automorphism, and then you look at the action on the two form. This tells you that the transcendental lattice in the invariant part of the H2, I mean, this is not so strange, just to give an idea, because the, two, the period lives in the transcendental lattice tensorized by C. So it's not so strange that this is in the invariant uh, lattice. And then you take the orthogonal complement, and this is contained in the Picard group. And you see what I was saying at the beginning. So this, um, this, uh, the size of this H2, this orthogonal complement, can tell you how big can, can be this Picard group. So it can tell you, OK, a key three surface with two small Picard group can never have this or that automorphism, for example. For example, you take in symplectic involution, here you have at least eight. So you, a K3 surface of Picard number five will never have a, a symplectic automorphism of order two, for example. So that's why it's quite useful to compute these two lattices to understand several things. And let me fix the following lattice. So uh, the call L20, so this is notation of Kondo, which is a signature three zero. So this is, a, well, 4, 0, minus 2, 0, 4, minus 2, minus 2, minus 2, 12. And remark that this lattice is um, two times an even lattice. Because essentially, well, you see you have four on the diagonal. This is quite important. You will see uh, why. Because actually, can, from this, we can decide uh, which are, what are the K3 surfaces. And uh, Kondo, in fact, show in his paper looking at the action of the cohomology, that the invariant lattice for the action of M20 is this L20, from why the name. So you see, this is the name. So this means, as I said before again, so the, the rank of the orthogonal complement is 19. So this tells us that you, the Picard group uh, must be at least of the Picard number 19, because it's contained, so it's quite big. But remember, so in our case, we are interested in the case where the K3 surface is projective, so because you, we want also non symplectic automorphism. So, result of Nikuri tells us okay, so this is negative definite lattice, but uh, our KT is projective. And when you have something projective, you can always produce, um, so you have always a, one class more. And this gives you one class more, which is more of a positive. Sorry, so it's positive. So it cannot be contained in this, um, sorry, in this orthogonal complement. So this means that your, your Picard number must be 20, cannot be 19, because it's negative definite. And you know that, well, the Picard group is signature one something. So this tells you that the Picard number is 20 from one side. And this is why what I was writing here. So because it contains this ample invariant class with square 40 because your lattice is a two times an even lattice. So more precisely, to be precisely, so it contains the polarization, so the ample class, plus the transcendental lattice. So remember the transcendental lattice, when you have a symplectic automorphism, is contained in the invariant part. And the fact that L20 is two times an even lattice tells you something more, that um, your transcendental lattice is um, of this form. We've seen that um, um, the square of your element lives in 4z. So this means that your transcendental lattice is even, but it's even more because it's two times an even lattice. So you can write in that way for A to B to B for C, for A, B, C that are positive in the non negative integers. And actually, transcendental lattices or this form, the bilinear form, rank two bilinear, rank two bilinear form allows you to classify K3 surfaces. So there is this uh, beautiful result of Schaudet Nose, 1977, telling that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence from the set of singular, but here singular means Picard number 20, K3 surfaces, to the set of equivalence classes of positive definite in, even integral binary quadratic form with respect to SL2Z. So uh, singular, yes, so singular for K3 surfaces, you, you know, probably can be using two meaning, uh, singular in the sense you have singularities, ADE, but the singular also the meaning that Picard number is 20. And uh, so in that theorem, I wanted to, to give the, the original formulation. They say singular in that sense. But see, when, when you study K3 surfaces with Picard number 20, you can go to, to this uh, positive definite rank two uh, 
uh, quadratic form, and then you can recover your K3 surface. So that's why it's so important, in particular when you have PCAN number 20 to compute the transcendental lattice. And the fact that your transcendental lattice is two times an even lattice, so the two times, I mean, the bilinear form is multiplied by two, again, show they know they show that it's a Coomer surface. So that's why you find, so for example, Kondo finds that his surface is a Coomer surface, or again, in our case, everything is a Coomer surface. And just make to, to maybe to, to make a break, <laughs> the, the, just let me recall what is a Coomer surface. I, I mean, every single few maybe know, but it's a very nice construction maybe. And so recall that it's just the quotient of an abelian surface by an involution acting on it, an involution at 16 uh, singular points. So the quotient has 16 singularities of type A1. So I draw the picture here. So it's just the, the vertex of the cone, just uh, maybe the, the most, are the most simple singularities one can have. And when you take the resolution, so here you are, so you see your, you have your Coomer surface and it contains the minimal resolution of 16 rational curves. So Coomer surface is, uh, in general, has PK number 17. In our case, we have 20, so it is something um, that is even a bit uh, more special. So let's back, uh, uh, go back a bit uh, to the proof, just again uh, to give you some more idea. Well, we have uh, an uh, our exact sequence, again, where you have M20, the symplectic part of G, and mu M, which is the quotient of G by M20, the non-symplectic part. Now we want to bound mu M, we want to bound M, we want to find what is M. Well, there is a result on Ikuli, again, saying that um, the Euler totem function of M divides the rank of the transcendental lattice, which here is two. Essentially because uh, this mu M part acts by primitive root of unity on the transcendental lattice. And, uh, and so that's why the euler totten function divides M. And so this gives us that M is one, two, three, four, or six. There are no other possibility. And we are assuming that M is not one to have a genuine extension of M20. So, and moreover, we know that mu M acts on the invariant lattice, L20. But um, how it acts, so it acts not trivially. Again, it's, uh, this is always a condo result. And condo can compute, but this is not, uh, one can do it by hand, compute the, the isometries of L20, and so that the order is 16. So this means that uh, you cannot have M equal three or six. So this tells you that M is in two on four. And uh, in fact, all the two cases where we have formulated the result are possible. Uh, so you have the exact sequence. The first one is condo exact sequence. And the second one is, uh, let's say, our exact sequence, where you have uh, mu2. And in fact, for example, to show that you cannot have bigger order, for example, one idea, just look uh, in the Xiaos list, and then you start to, to study uh, all different groups and see that you cannot have here biggest extension. So the, the condo gives you three, the maximal order as is containing this paper. And that the next order possible is given by these two cases with uh, mu2. So the order is 1920. And you want to know what is G? Well, in both cases, one can show the, the, the find a section and show that second splits so that uh, G is a semi direct product of uh, m20 with uh, mu m with m equal 2 and 4. So in fact, so how can we, we could, uh, just resuming a bit uh, what, uh, what the proof is about these two cases, one has to study how the lattice ZL embeds in L20, for example, just to study how the polarization can you put in L20, you know that this must be live here. Then you know that M2 acts on L20, so this extension, and this allows you to compute the transcendental lattice. Okay, so that uh, one has to use pretty much lattice theory to, to determine the transcendental lattice. So I put again here the theorem so you can see again. So essentially we study the embedding of four in L20 and then we compute the orthogonal complement. So there is only one such embedding. And then you can compute that um, the orthogonal complement, that one and the same for eight. And these two groups, as I said, are maximal. So you have Kondo and these two, two, two maximal groups. So let me uh, now say some word about uh, the, 
the, the K3 surfaces with um, how can one realize the K3 surfaces, how one can uh, describe them, give the equation for them. Well, we have these two divisors with uh, L squared equal to four and eight, okay, which, uh, in, sorry, in the theorem is here. So I'm talking about these two cases, which are G invariant for these two different extensions. So these are really two different extension of, uh, of N20 and are not contained in the group of condom. So we are all in this uh, sense of maximal groups. Then uh, since L is invariant, you can use it to, to, to embed them your K3 surfaces in some projective space. So here one use very much Sandona result about a linear system on K3 surfaces, for example. And uh, since the, this polarization of this ample class is invariant, so this means that your group G can be linearized and come from an action of the projective space. And this is pretty much useful because it tells you how you can uh, realize your group, which uh, it's not, not always this, the case. So sometimes you, you lose your group when you, when you look at your K3 surface in some projective space. No, not always, not, not any automorphism of a K3 surface, for example, a quarty, come from the projective space. But then this allows us to find example in P3 and P5. So when you have L squared equal to four, again, you have four divided by two plus one is three, eight divided by two plus one is five. So that's, again, use theory of K3 surfaces tells you the first one is a quartic, and the second one is a complete intersection of three quintics. So this was two examples, again, that already appeared in Edgar's talk uh, two weeks ago. So the contour surface, uh, unluckily, unluckily, has a um, polarization of square 14. Again, uh, 40 divided by 220 plus 121, so it lives in P21. So one can try to describe there, but, um, well, it's uh, a lot of equation. If I have a bit of time at the end, I'll give you a singular model of that, singular with, uh, in sense, again, now with uh, ADA singularities, because all these surfaces, as, as I say, pick number 20. So there is not um, a positive dimensional family. And here, just, a one, just one for each group, there is only one. So the first case, let's say the case of uh, polarization of degree four, so L squared equal to four. So give you a quartic in P3. And take now the example of Mukai. So we have seen at the beginning. So I, I recall the example here with the M20 action. So you see, it is your equation with the Fermat quartic and uh, this term here. So we can perform a change of coordinates. So I'm, I'm not different step. And you can change the coordinate of your equation just write in that form. So I wanted to write the original form of Mukai and then this form. But in this form, you see uh, that there is an automorphism more. Uh, this involution was the evolution we have seen all the beginning. Just change the signs of the third coordinate. And you have seen all the beginning, it is a non-symplectic one. So it cannot come from the, from the M20. And in fact, if you add this to M20, this gives you a biggest group, an extension of order two, which is our, what they call GMU. So this group, this extension of order two of M20. And the interesting fact of this is that this GMU is a, a complex reflection group. And it's called, G, it is in the classification, there is a classification of complex reflection groups. And it is the G29, if you look in the shepard todd classification. Actually, so it is interesting because we arrived to study this problem from this side of complex reflection groups. So we are interested in action of complex reflection group on surfaces of general type and then study quotient, try to find K3 surfaces. And when we arrive to G29, well, we arrive to study this problem of maximality of uh, groups that it was actually was not our original motivation, but it happened very often when one start to study a problem. And I wanted to show a picture of, uh, I could not draw a picture of uh, X Mukai. So if you start to draw a picture, there are too many, so it is not connected because of course this is a picture in, in the real world and then it is not, there are complex point of course, but I could uh, modify a bit the parameter. So, so again, kind of deformation to find a nice, a nice um, picture that is not, say it's not really it's Mukai, but it's the family should have 12 singularities just for fun to, to see, to see another K3 surface. So let me give all, say some more about the equation of the, 
the other K3 surface, uh, which lives in P5. So now we take the polarization as square equal to eight. So again, you can see that then a, a complete intersection of three smooth quadrix in P5. And um, we wanted to, to see how, how does this quadrix looks like. Well, you have to find the right action of M20. So it turns out that M20 does not have a reducible representation on C6. So one, we study central extension. Central extension are not bad, it's not a problem because when you, we are interested in the projective and group, and then they, they disappear. So we could find some central extension and find some irreducible representation on C6. And then this allows us then to, to find the, the equation somehow. So uh, take a GBH, the subgroup of GLCs generated by these matrices. So just give an idea of what one can become, get. Then in fact, the projective group associated with that group generated by these matrices is exactly the, the group we were looking for. It is an extension of M20. So there is some number computation on that contain M20 and it is an extension of order two. So it must be that one because our theorem tell us that this group exists. And then if you let the act your group on the, on the polynomial of degree two and try to find invariant one, then one could, we could find this set of invariant. So these are a singular uh, quadrix in P5, but the intersection is smooth. One can check that the intersection locus is smooth and then it is a K3 surface. And the funny thing or the interesting thing that you find appearing in the golden ratio that actually is a number that appear very often each time that you, you start studying metric things, so often appear the golden ratio. And why we call this XBH, so that's um, just because actually, as I told you, we work together with uh, Brown to Nashimoto, so actually we change very much. And they ask us, do you have equation for that, uh, that K3 surface? And, and we could, uh, could answer the question. And so we decided to call the, the, the K3 surface XBH and PGBH, so that's uh, because they asked the question. So just two minutes, just I promise I give you all an equation of X condo just to be complete, uh, just to see how, how it looks like. So, so just very, very fast, because again, you see coming in, into the plane against surfaces that we have seen during the talk. So you're taking out the quartic, as I say, Fermat has Picard number 20, so many, many automorphism. But it has also symplectic involution, like this one, minus x minus y. And one can compute the lattice of f. This is a work of Finoza, actually, again, something very classical. That is Picard with the transcendental lattice is 8008. Then you make the quotient by the symplectic involution, and you take the minimal resolution. It's an, again a K3 surface. And the noses show that between this minimal resolution, which is your F prime and your F, there is this relation. So two times the transcendental lattice of the minimal resolution is the transcendental lattice of F. So that tells you that your transcendental lattice must be that one. But then it turns out, this was the computation of Kondo, that is exactly the transcendental lattice of the Kondo surface. So that you find a nice realization which is a singular one because it's a quotient. So you see, if you want to want to see the equation, it is a quotient. So it has eight singularities because a symplectic involution has a eight A1 singularities. And you can write the equation in some weighted projective space, as I wrote here. You take just the invariant by the action. So x square, y square, x, y, z, and t. And this gives you these two equations in the four dimensional projective space P1, 2, 2, 2. And one can check that, uh, in fact, the, the, the surface contains exactly 81 singularities and, uh, and nothing more, so that we have an equation. And I think in the paper of Brandhorst and Ashimoto, they, they, they could find a smooth equation in some space for this condo surface. OK, I thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much. Let's all give a round of applause.